Hi, my name is Ricky and welcome to episode number six of Share Your Story. Share Your Story is all about men and women sharing a story with us. No matter if you were a combat medic or cook on a ship, active or veteran, we want to hear about it. Check description for more information on how to apply. Uh, my next guest is from America and we are about to hear his story. His name is Rudy. Hi, Rudy. How you doing? Hey, how you doing, Ricky? I'm fantastic. How are you? I'm good. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, we're going to start like we always do. Uh, and that's basically we're going to start from the beginning, Rudy, or basically how far behind you want to go. It's all up to you. So you were in service. Let's talk about the year. Yes. When did you get in? I joined in, I, I graduated high school in 1979. I was 17 years old. Um, I actually, uh, uh, like in my, right in the beginning of my senior year, when I was 16, uh, I took the ASVAB, which is the Armed Services Vocational Aptitude Battery Test. It's wow. the basic test you take to kind of, <laughs> to kind of get you into, you know, wh wh what are you going to do? What do you qualify for? All of that stuff. Academically, I could have done anything in any of the services, any job in any of the services I qualified for. And I originally had taken it for the Air Force. Uh, but the Navy recruiters, they were all in the same building. The Air Force, Army, Navy, and Marines were all in the same building when I was in Sarasota, Florida. Um, and the Navy recruiters saw my ASVAB scores, and they have uh, the Naval Nuclear Power Program. Uh, they um, ended up glomming onto me and convinced me to go Navy. Uh, Navy submarines. And so I went into the Navy. I actually signed up in a delayed entry program. They had this thing called a delayed entry program where you, you basically commit to going in. So it's, it's, it's like you're enlisted, but you're not technically enlisted, but you're committed. And all of that time that you, from the time that you commit to the time you actually enlist, actually counts as time in service. Oh, okay. So when you go for promotions, it's you, you've already got like almost a year in when you really didn't so i mean coming out of boot camp which was eight weeks long and i was 17 when i went in i graduated uh, i think june the 6th and one week later i was in in boot camp and i was i didn't turn 18 until i was well into my a school okay so you but, went, you um, went into school. the navy and yes i went to the united states navy uh, they, they, they convinced me to go and I had another friend of mine. He was a, a good buddy of mine. I was cooking at a restaurant as for a job and he was going in uh, submarines. And so we both went in together and I went into, uh, I started uh, at, at a boot camp. I was an E3 uh, enlisted thir a third level up. Uh, a lot of people who come out are E1s or E2s. I was an E3 coming out of boot camp. And then from boot camp, I went to, I took boot camp in Orlando, Florida. Uh, that base, I think, is no longer there. But at the time, there was a big naval training center in Orlando, Florida. And I was in Sarasota, which is on the west coast of Florida. And so I went to Orlando, <clears throat> boot camp. After boot camp, I went to San Diego, California for my A school. And A school, the letter A, uh, is basically where you learn your job, the rate that you are. And I was an interior communications electrician. I went to ICA school. And um, after A school, I went to free. Uh, actually, I took a couple of other training classes, like basic electronic electricity and some other training classes. Then I went to, back to Orlando to Naval Nuclear Power School. When I was in Orlando, I ended up getting married. A big mistake I made. Um, I got married at 18 to a 16 year old. Uh, she was my girlfriend from high school and didn't work out well. She ended up divorcing seven months down the road. But while I was in nuke school, uh, my marriage was kind of going downhill. And to give you an idea of how hard Naval Nuclear Power School is, they have an eight week preschool to get you up to speed. So you can go into the 24-week nuke school. Oh and that 24-week nuke school was two and a half years of reactor principle. Oh, so, oh my, that's a lot. Isn't that a lot? 
uh, insane amount. The yeah. attrition rate is over 88%. Oh, over mean- 88% of the people start the school don't finish. 88. That's Yeah. At last when when I was going in. So you're talking about that something back, that, back in the day. You said something about E1, E2, E3. Is that Yeah, it, that, that's it. that's the that's the pay grade and your rank your rank and your your rank is E1, E2, E3. So it'd be a seaman a recruit, seaman apprentice, and seaman is E3. And then oh. from seaman, you go, you become a non commissioned officer. Okay. You become petty officer third class, and petty officer second, and petty officer first, then chief petty officer, then senior chief, then master chief. Okay. So and it's all about. Uh, okay. So, but what was it different when you. Uh, left, you had an E3, and others had E1, E2. E2s are in one, yeah, because I was in an acce- accelerated program. Also, the time and rate that I got from being the late entry played in. Because okay. ap- you have to have so much time and rate before you can qualify to go to the next rate up. Okay, there's certain qualifications. Sometimes you have to take tests, and you have to pass the test, and you have to have so much time and rate, or you have to do X number of things, X, Y, Z, or whatever, depending upon the rate, to become that rate. Now, mo- most of the time, it's just taking a test or, or having the time and rate when you're really low. But once you get up to the like, petty officer, it becomes you have to take a test and pass a test and, and whatnot, and have the time and service as whatever rate you're at before you can go up. So coming out of boot camp, I was E3. I was kind of like a, head, a step ahead. And, and certain rates, uh, like machinist mate or the electronics technician or navig, you know, whatever, those different jobs called the rate in the service, um, some of them fill up faster. More people want to do them. So it's harder to get promoted in yeah. certain rates uh, because they can only have so many X number of E5s in that rate. They, they're allowed X number of E5s. And so, but IC was a pretty open rate. It was pretty easy to get up and easy to move on because there wasn't a lot of people in there at the time. And then later on, what I found out is in nuke school, there was four different rates that they, they were training. There was an electronics technician, a machinist mate, uh, um, electrician's mate, and an IC man and I, interior communications. And then at, later they just kind of combined the IC and the EM, electricians made into one. And they just used EM for nukes. So there's only three rates that are nuclear rated. But anyway, so going into the school, <clears throat> there was an eight week preschool just to get you up to speed to take the 24 weeks of nuke school. And it was extremely demanding. Uh, very, very hard. I, I, classes like heat transfer and fluid flow things like that. So I was going through a hard time with my marriage at the time I was going to this school and my grades started to go down. And as my grades started to go down, they started adding mandatory study hours. And as my mandatory study hours went up, my my marriage got worse. And as my marriage got worse, my grades went down. As my grades went down, the hours went up until I was doing a mandatory 80-hour weeks. Oh. So I had to do 40 hours of school and 40 hours of extra study every week. Wow. That's insane. That's, uh, that's numbers right there. That is not. <laughs> uh, so how do you I actually under manage to do this? Pressure. Yeah. Well, actually, I didn't. I got to yeah. the, the last week of school. I still had a passing average. It was <laughs> passing, but it was, it was still passing. Actually, I went to an 18th week academic review board to see how they weed you out. And 27 people took that academic review board. Three people passed. And wow. I was one of those three. Just saying nuke okay. school. I'm just going to say nuke school. And everyone just will understand that this is something extreme. You, I can't yeah, even, well, I can't even such, grasp it's, it. It's two, and a half years of, yeah. it's two and a half years of reactor principles squashed wow. into 24 weeks. So wow. that's what it is. I mean, it's yeah. insane. That's why the, the attrition rate is in up there, uh, you know, way up there. It's as easily as high an attrition rate as the the uh, Marine Sniper program, which my son was. I oh. have a son who was a Marine Scout Sniper. Um, yeah. 
So, yeah. So, I mean, that's an incredibly hard program to get through. So I, my grades were going down. My marriage went downhill. My grades went up. So I was doing 80-hour mandatory weeks. So I finally got to the 20, right before the finals, they figured I wasn't going to pass the finals. And so they, they, they asked me. All right. And um, I never had a sensation. Like when they told me I was off out of that school, I had a physical sensation of a weight being taken off my, my shoulders. Yeah. It was a physical sensation of a release of pressure and a headache. And a- <laughs> that's how, well, I mean that I was 80 hour mandatory weeks. That's yeah. a long time. Yeah, it is. That's, it's kind of hard. Yeah. It's completely insane, but I guess it has to. So, yeah. Yeah. Go. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I mean, so, so I'm saying, so I, I, I missed out on doing that, but I still got to go to sub school. Uh, and which again, going to submarine school, it's unique because that's the only type of ship that you have to go to a school and pass before you can serve on. There's no carrier school or destroyer school or frigate school. Yeah. But there is a submarine school because it's such a, such a unique situation and a unique environment where one person can certainly kill everybody. Yeah. You can sink the whole boat. One yeah. person can do something wrong and sink the whole boat. Yeah. I mean, and, I wouldn't be able while, to go down there. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be completely honest with you, Rudy. Just thinking about going down a freaking submarine, I'm gonna say a hell no to that. Period. Continue. We would take a string. <laughs> we would, we would take a string when we were uh, in the passageways, right? That look, and, and passageways are nothing like movies. You know, I, I grew up watching Voyage at the Bottom of the Sea, right? Where you know, oh, yeah. three people are walking side by side down a passageway, 50 feet, turn right and go 50 feet. I'm like, well, what kind of sub is that? Yeah, it's uh, a big sub. Wasn't quite that way. <laughs> <on the boat. laughs> you, you had, you got really personal with the person you're passing in the passageway, <laughs> if you know what I mean. They yeah, go, rubbing, nut rubbing. to butt. <laughs> yeah, nut to butt. Yeah, uh, I get it. That's what they called it. Uh, so, I mean, so you're getting personal. So those passageways aren't that wide. And we would take a string and tie it tight right up above in the top of the passageway while we're on the surface. And when we're down cruising, there would be a sag in that string about a good six inches. So in other words, the hull of the ship was getting compressed. Oh. And the hull is six inches of titanium steel. You're already freaking out. (laughs) <laughs> that's a lot of pressure yeah going on that boat but i passed submarine school like i said it's the only school that you have to go to a, a class to pass and they and they train you that you do an escape and rescue from they have this like 75 foot water tower well what was your feeling and they have this i mean I'm, i gotta ask you well so the first time you step down into a submarine and that bad boy is going down uh, you can you can feel it it's going down i'm just gonna assume you can feel it what about, yes you can how were you what, your thoughts were you scared? well it's interesting because well no well i was nervous i wasn't scared i was nervous like anything else doing something new um my watch station was actually in the control room uh so i you know whenever i was on duty i was in the control room, I had a roving watch where, I, but I every hour I'd have to go do rounds and and do readings and whatnot and, and take care of stuff, and then you come back to the control room. So I basically sat in the control room, unless I was on my round. So I was in the control room when I first went down, um, uh, and they shut that hatch and you and you spin that little wheel and you say bye bye for about uh, three and a half months. Oh, until you come back. Wow, so you so you, you wave, long. yeah, you wave goodbye because I was on there's back when I was in there was only two types of submarines. Now there are three, but back then there was only two. There's a fast attack and a fleet ballistic missile submarine. The fast attacks are the ones that go at the hunter killers. They go mix it up with the enemy, find them, hunt them down. The boomers, as they call the fleet ballistic missile boats, uh, their mission was to remain undetected. And be able to launch the missiles. God forbid the order ever came. So they're the ones with the big nuke missiles. You so we we one. always said we, yeah, I was on a boomer, and, and yeah. we always called it we hide with pride, you know. Yeah, um, <laughs> that's a good because we we all, we'd always run away when you know we would see all of the submarines of the enemy, the Russian boats. This is back during the Cold War now. 
Oh. Get that in your brain. This is during the cold. Oh, war. now we're getting exciting here. All right. Yeah. Okay. So we were out at, uh, running around, as, and I go into the Intel plot in the nav center, and there's a map of where we're at. And you see a little blue pin. That was us. I was on the USS John Adams, SSBN 620. I was on the blue crew. And uh, we had a little blue pin for John Adams, and then there's all these red pins. And all, all those were the Soviet boats that we can hear. And we could hear them f way far away before they ever heard us. And we'd, I mean, we'd always run away when we'd, we'd see them. We'd be able to go the other way. Um, in fact, one time we were coming in, we had to wait three extra days because there was too many Soviet boats between us and the coast. And we had to wait for the fast attacks to go scoot out a, a lane for us to come through so that we couldn't risk being detected. So, well, I mean, that's could, how, how high could, the, that's yeah. how, how could they, uh, okay. I'm stupid in this sense. So you were on a nuclear, not stupid, power just driven, not, not stupid, just not informed. Yeah. So you were on a nuclear powered submarine. Yes. And yes. the Russians nuclear powered had, fleet ballistic missiles. So. Yeah. So the Russians had like diesel. So that was easier for you guys to detect them. Right. Or, well, they had diesel. They also had nukes too, but we could still hear them because their sound insulation technology oh, was so far behind ours. Yeah, I read about. This. They didn't sound insulate anything, so you can hear them. Farming and around we in were, there. yeah, yeah, they, we, yeah, you can hear things clashing down in in the mess decks and and crap like that. Sometimes you can hear people talking if it was really bad. Uh, wow, yeah. but we would never get that close. Uh, I would hear that for about other boats because we would never, we would always run away whenever that we wouldn't go near a submarine. Uh, we, because our mission was to remain undetected. Kind of can't do that when you're mixing it up with the enemy. So yeah, we would always run away. And and like I said, we had we were uh, under for longer. The fast attacks were out of their home port for longer than we were, but they were never underwater for as long as they'd always come up the port and come at different ports and come. They'd be around and about showing that's a, showing their presence is kind of the the role of the fast attack. I was like, hey, don't mess with us, right? So, so anyway, you can you can understand it. We, and the, the the boomers we we ran away. We didn't mess with any of that stuff. But yeah. uh, I would go into the intel plot and see all these red pins and there's all the boats. And they can even tell how many blades are on the, the props of the boat. We listen. We do submarine tracking exercises, like fire control exercises, and we'd pick a, a, a fishing boat. So there could have been some Swedish fishing boat out there. You know, Sven is up there, herd, 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 bird. Uh, you know, Come going on. his own way, and underneath <laughs> the water, here's a nuclear submarine running tracking drills on yeah. fire control torpedo drills. I can actually on the see ship. the Swedish boat being. Uh... The Swedish chef, everyone, everyone, everyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone heard, 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 heard. Yeah, heard, 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 heard. yeah and, that, you know, as yeah, Sven and Ollie are up there. Yeah. Sven and Ollie are up there on their boat. Yeah, and and here we are doing <laughs> fire control exercises. No clue. underneath the water. No clue. No yeah. clue whatsoever <laughs> that we were there. Uh, typical. But Swedish. we would hear. <laughs> But we would hear boats from, you can hear them way far away, you know, and they would say mother effer, mother, you know, yeah. the yeah, yeah, family yeah. friendly version, you know, that, that would tell how many props they were, uh, um, or uh, son of a beast, you know, uh, they would tell, they would know how many props are on each boat. That's how good our sonar was. But what, so, what kind of water are we talking, Atlantic or? North Atlantic, North, North Atlantic. Atlantic. I yeah. did cir yeah. circles in the North Atlantic. I remember seeing Iceland through the periscopes once when we had to heal a back a guy out. That's nice. The guy had toothache. He had an impacted tooth. He needed to get a dental dental surgery. And we don't have a doc. We don't even have a doctor on board, much less a dentist. We only have a corpsman. That's that's our doctor is a Navy corpsman. Yeah. Um, so there's no doctor per se, you know, medical doctor. There's just a corpsman. So we had to heal a back this guy out uh, and take him home. And oh, so yeah. we surfaced off of the coast of iceland that's cool um, and i, I remember I, I was in i was in the control room and i asked the captain hey can i look through the periscope he goes sure so i'm looking hey look there's iceland uh, rocks and snow yeah that's iceland 
Yeah, that's very <laughs> you're was. very stereotypical now <laughs> yeah but it's true well it, i mean I, I actually iceland has more green than greenland greenland yeah. has got more ice than iceland yeah that's, uh, that's, but, that's uh, make, doesn't yeah, make any sense technically speaking <laughs> yeah but uh but i just saw rocks and snow like yeah that's iceland yeah it was yeah, okay <laughs> that makes sense <laughs> that was it yeah we that makes sense we didn't do much of, i did a, a total of one port of call my entire four years in the navy um i did one port of call because like i said boomers boomer it was lisbon portugal oh yeah so you actually yeah okay, and they actually made us anchor out in the river because they didn't want a, a bunch of missiles parked in their in their port that makes sense we had to have a liberty launch come out and take us back and forth to the to the to the land but that was the only port of call i ever saw basically it was just circles under the north atlantic and you basically you're on a 18 hour day i know i heard just recently they've gone to 24 but back in my day this was 18 hour day so you're on six hours on 12 hours off six hours on 12 hours off six hours on 12 hours off so every day you wake up it's a different meal one day it could be breakfast the next it'll be mid rats then it's dinner then it's lunch then it's breakfast again then it's so you're always rotating the meals that you wake up to uh yep. On what? the boat, so it's it's kind of hard to uh, to figure out, you know, what time of day it is. So you you work in shifts. Yes. Yeah. But There's three watch you, sections. You, three watch what, sections. Yeah. What did you do down in the submarine when you when it wasn't your shift? Well, if you weren't submarine qualified, and that's earning what they call the dolphins, is is the submarine qualification warfare pin uh, that they call dolphins, and you earn those as opposed to the surface warfare pin is if you take a test and say that you're on a ship you get the surface warfare pin to earn the dolphins you have to know something about every system on the boat and you have to know everybody's job wow is that, that's they, asking a lot though isn't it there's there was a qual card that you had to go through and they and they would they call it ripping your tits off. I mean, you go, you have to get checked out on a system. Yeah. And in one could be a hydraulic system, the hydraulic system. Okay. So you go to the guy who's the, who works with the hydraulic system and he'll ask you all kinds of questions and give you lookups. Everyone gave you a look. Oh, you got to come back with that answer. Come back with that answer. And when they're satisfied that you know it, they'll sign off on that system. And each system is a part of a block. And once you go through each system, then you got to go back and redo the block. Okay. and get them all again on the block and then when there's several blocks to your call card and then once you get all the blocks done you got to go back again and do a walkthrough and and they will take you from the bow to the stern what's that where does that go what does that do why do i do this where do i go there what do i do this um they will tell you every day they say i'm a molecule of air take me in from the snorkel mass what bulkhead flappers and what circulation fans do i go through wow. to get to the engine room okay so you have to know something about every system on the boat to get your dolphins. So earning those is quite, quite deal. When you get your dolphins, they back in the day again, today's Navy is such a bunch of weenies because, because <laughs> they don't have hazing anymore. And what happened back in my day when you got your dolphins pinned on your chest, the captain, one of the pictures I, I sent to you, was me getting my dolphins pinned on in the yeah. mess decks on the submarine by the captain. What happens is the captain pins them on, hey, you have qualified submarines, we give you your certificate. He runs away because he knows what's gonna happen next and, he, and plausible deniability is a thing. So he doesn't wanna know, he doesn't wanna be party to anything. So he'll run away and then everyone who's already qualified gets to tack them on. In other words, they punch them onto your chest. Oh, really? And so everybody on the boat who's already qualified, which could be like 70, there's 150 guys on the boat. It could be anywhere that half of them is qualified at least. The punch you in the chest. On the pin. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, where's the pin? Is it on and the so they drive the, the pin on your uniform. Yeah. It's on your uniform, and then they just punch it. And, of course, the little backs to those pins get shoved into your chest, and you get a <laughs> bruise like the size of chili or something, you know, just on your chest. and. I mean, it's just a it, 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 boy. That hurt. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I, I always thought that was a stupid, stupid tradition. I, I figured. I said I was never going to do that to anybody. I wasn't going to tack anyone's dolphins on, until this one guy had to say something the day before he was getting qualified. He was an E three, 
I was an E5 by then. I was a second class petty officer. I was already qualified. And he was cussing me out. Ooh. And, you know, he, and he'd say, F you, uh, Rudy, um, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, hey, dude, are you getting your dolphins tomorrow? He said, yes. He says, okay, hold that thought. I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> And I was made sure I was the first guy. And but when the captain leaves, when he pins him on and runs away, by then there's a line of people already lining up to congratulate you, as it as it were. Yeah. And I was the first guy on. And this guy, his name was McDonald. And I, boy, I I think I bent his pin <laughs> when I when I tacked him on. And by then there was a line of people ready to congratulate him sincerely on his getting his dolphins so some people just didn't know how to operate in that environment you definitely don't want to make enemies on no. a submarine no because the... some submariners are a unique bunch man you never ever tell a submariner what bothers you ever ever do that that's a mistake because they will make it their career to do that <laughs> oh yeah yeah that, yeah. that i mean yeah that's... i mean one time there was these there was these things called danger tags and, and caution tags. If you have to work on a, on a system, let's say I have to work on uh, the navigation, this, this gyro compass system. I was part of my rate, it was just the gyro compass was in my, my, my domain. So I have to work on that. I have to tag it out, turn it off so it can't be used. And sometimes you have to put these tags on. And if you can use the system, but just under certain circumstances, they have a yellow tag called a caution tag. And it tells the person, you know, you can use the system under these conditions or at these times, or whatever, okay? So it, it, someone doesn't get fried while they're working on something, right? But if you have to actually can't use it at all, for example, let's say you're in port and you're working on the mast position switches inside the sail, because as a mast goes up and down the sail, it connects to certain positions to tell whether it's up or down. These are little connector, uh, electronic, electrical uh, connections that say, oh, I'm up at uh, this point position now, now I'm down at this position. So this, these different sensors are in, in the sail. And if you're in the sail, you don't want the sail going up and down, it could kill you. So they have to, to tag it out and they have a red danger tag. And it says, do not use this, period. Um, and so you can't use that. You know, put the actual tag on the switch or whatever to say, hey, don't use this system. But if you take a yellow caution tag and a green magic marker like a green highlighter you get a blue tag <laughs> and we told this one guy that there was this special blue tag out <laughs> that he had to do and we on a tag out system you have to go to the people that are responsible for that system and get them to okay the tag out and and up to including the captain sometimes to say okay you can do this or you know i'm, I'm signing off on the tag out so we had this guy going all over the boat and we told these people just to, to sign it and pass him on to keep him going for this incredibly long chain of people to try to get uh, uh, okays on this blue tag out. And I think this is important. He actually went up into the tender and we had him going through the tender getting checkouts. And so one guy said, you idiot, there's no such thing as a blue tag. <laughs> um, but we, he spent the day going around getting these tag outs uh uh on this yeah i mean that's what they would do they would or they told this one guy they gave him a deck wrench which is basically like an x tire iron you know like this x tire irons you have yeah they have the four different sides yeah. that was we had these access panels in the superstructure that you need to get into and out of that's free flooding when you're underwater but and when you're in port you have to go in there and, and access stuff. So they have this deck wrench. It's kind of like a, like a big tire arm. You can undo the bolts on these hatches and get into the superstructure. Well, we told this guy it was the key to start the ship's engines. And he had to wake up the engineering officer to give him the key so we can start the ship's engines. No. Yes. And <laughs> he woke up the uh, third highest ranking officer on the boat to give him a deck wrench and say, here's the key to start the ship's engines. <laughs> so, so, like I said, the atmosphere on a submarine is unique. But it was a bunch of fun, wasn't it? it? 
Well, there were times. Yeah. We, we, we always tried to make fun. Like halfway through the patrol, we'd have a special night called Halfway Night. You know, from that point on, it's downhill, right? You, you've made yeah. the halfway through your patrol. And now we'd have a special dinner and we would do um, skits and they would vote on skits. And actually, one of the pictures I sent to you was me with a microphone in my hand. I was actually doing stand up comedy. Oh, where I won the best act and got 40 bucks. Yay. Oh, 40 bucks. So, yeah. Hey, back back in 1982, that was a lot. You went into so, service uh, the same year I was born. Uh, <laughs> so that kind of made Wow, me. okay. I grad yeah, I was 79 <laughs> to 83. Yeah. So, yeah, it's insane. So, if you continue a bit here, uh how long did, so you did your service uh on a nuclear uh submarine for how long? Four years. Four years. Mm -hmm. Did anything happen, like a dangerous or? Uh, well, we that... almost sank a, a once. We almost sank once. That was kind of thrilling. Tell me um, about it. <laughs> well, uh, okay. Uh, if you can picture a submarine, yeah, they have a ballast tanks. The way ballast tanks work, it, uh, a submarine has to be, in order for it to float, you have to be lighter than the water you displace. So the volume of water that you're displacing in your sub, if your sub weighs less than that volume of water, you have positive buoyancy. You go up. Yeah. If your sub weighs exactly as much as the water that you displace, you have neutral buoyancy. You just sit there. Yeah. And if you weigh more than the water you displace, you have negative buoyancy and you go down. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so that's how submarine kind of works. And they have a forward group and an after group of ballast tanks, one near the front, one near the back. And the way it works is there's a, a, a valve on the top of the tank that opens and closes, like a little round valve that just pops up and down. And the bottom is just a grate, an open grate. So water can go in and out freely. And so what happens is they'll close the vent on the top, pump air into the tank, that pushes the water out the grate down the bottom, then now that you've now lost a lot of the water that you're displacing, now you're lighter than the water you displace and you start to go up. Right? Can yeah. you understand that? Yeah, you see I'm that? With, yeah, I'm that's, how, that's how the ballast tanks work. Well, one patrol, we were going on, the forward group blew, but the after group didn't. The valves were stuck. Oh. And so the nose started pitching up. The bow started pitching up. And the, and the stern was going down because yeah, it, wasn't, going it down. wasn't lighter. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and there's only so far up you can go before you can't recover because it's just a grate on the bottom. And if you, if you go too far of an angle, you just push air out the grate instead of pushing water out the grate. You're just pushing air out the grate. Yeah. That, that doesn't work anymore. So there's only so far up you can go before you can't recover. And I remember I was in control and they started, we started pitching up and I started seeing the depth going down and the bubble that's your up and down you know, bubbles going up. So we're, we were raising in our bubble and going down in our depth, which is not good. We were going sinking down towards the stern. And the captain started yelling and cussing and getting that blankety blank valve unstuck. And they're working at it and they're working on it. And, the, and, and there was the master chief of the boat, the senior enlisted person is called the Cobb, chief of the boat, called Cobb. Well, our Cobb was a master chief. This guy, he was, we used to joke that he was waiting at the docks with the sea bag packed when God filled the oceans. Uh, <laughs> that's the kind of guy this yeah, guy was. I okay. Get yeah. Uh, and when I saw him get nervous, how funny. Oh, I was looking God. at him and I'm like, oh, oh crap. <laughs> okay, I started saying prayers now. And I'm finally they have what they call an emergency ballast tank blow, EBT uh, EB switches. Um EBT switches that shoots forty five hundred pounds directly to the ballast tanks, bypasses the system, everything gets goes in, right? And um you're only supposed to do that if it's that or sink. Outside of testing, which you do in, during what they call sea trials, I can talk about that later. But they do that just to test it, which is a fun ride when you're doing it on a test. Not so fun when you're like you're, it's not a test. No. Um, and and the captain ran down, jumped off the con, and hit the switches at the on the ballast control panel, and 
up we went. But uh, yeah, that was kind of thrilling because we were getting very close to that. We were like probably four degrees up bubble from where you couldn't recover. So really close. By the time the captain hit the switch. Yeah, it was kind of close. So that was, that was interesting. And then we had a high radiation leak on the sub once. Um, that was also interesting. Um, I was, it was in, I was on watch in the control room and we were rigged for red and, and how, what that means is, you know, when you have night vision, uh, white light destroys your night vision, but red light doesn't. Okay. And so the officer of the deck, the guy who actually is in charge of the boat, um, has to be able to look through the periscopes at night if we're coming up to periscope depth. Um, cause a lot of times we have to come up the periscope depth to be able to transmit and receive messages. And we would trail this wire, uh, a long way off the boat when we were on periscope depth. And that's a funny story about that. You have to remind me about that one too. Uh, <laughs> but we would trail a wire off the boat and we'd come up the periscope depth and, 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 but he'd have to know that we're not coming up underneath another boat or if there's another dangers or anything around. So as you're coming up, he's on the periscope going around and around doing full circles making sure every, nothing's around us when we're coming up. And in order to do that, you have to have night vision if it's night outside. And so we would rig the, he would wear red goggles when it's nighttime. And, and when we're going up for, for uh, periscope depth, we'd rig for red. So we were rigged for red and it was kind of dark and it was a mid, mid watch. So the, the pulse of the boat was kind of low. A lot of people were sleeping. And I'm on the boat, and we have this eavesdropping circuit. They called it the white rat circuit uh, between the control room and the, and the engineering spaces. So we can hear what they're talking to each other back and forth, like between the, the control room, which controls the reactor, I mean, the, uh, the reactor compartment and, and uh, uh, maneuvering control, which controls the, the uh, reactor and the engineering spaces and the tunnel. They all talk to each other. But we were kind of eavesdropping listening to them. So I'm sitting there waiting to do my next round. And, and you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, submarine life is tedium. So you're just sitting there waiting to do your next round. And we're listening to the white rat circuit. And all of a sudden I, we hear um, control maneuvering, uh, um, maneuvering tunnel. We have a high radiation leak in the tunnel. And so someone in the tunnel, which is the, the, the little axis way above the reactor compartment because the reactor compartment is not the very back of the boat it's kind of like two-thirds of the way back from the bow but it's like uh not quite in the middle of the boat so there's compartments on the other side of the reactor compartment that you want to get to but you don't want to walk through the reactor compartment obviously because zoomies and stuff so there's a tunnel that you goes over the reactor compartment and they're monitoring what's going on down in the reactor compartment and, and all kinds of valves and whatnot and things that they can do uh, for the reactor in the tunnel. And that's just a way that you pass through from aux machinery one to aux machinery two, and you go across the tunnel, across the uh, reactor compartment. Well, we heard maneuvering tunnel, there's a high radiation leak in the tunnel. But what is a, uh, and, what is a leak? Just what Well, there was obviously a steam leak. Uh, there was some, oh. some Something uh, from the primary system, the way a nuclear reactor works, there's a primary and secondary cooling systems. The primary is all irradiated because that's what's actually around the core of the reactor. But then we, we, when that reactor heats up the water, it goes through what's called a steam generator. It's just a bunch of U-tubes, small little U-tubes, a lot of surface area. And, and it's totally separate, doesn't mix, but there's a secondary cooling system that goes over the U-tube that heats up. That's kind of like heating elements. And that water goes to the uh, steam generators, uh, turbines to produce electricity. So you have a primary coolant system and a secondary coolant system, mm -hmm. okay. right? Yeah. And, and they should never mix. They should never mix. Primary is all irradiated. The secondary is not. Well, oh. sometimes there, you, you there was a leak somehow from the primary system. That's not good, isn't it? Just assuming. Well, no, that's not good. That's why they said high radiation leak in the tunnel. <laughs> that's exactly why. Yeah, it's, yeah, no, yeah. it's not good. <laughs> and, and that's what I'm saying. We're all sitting there listening to this eavesdrop, and it's like, hey, did you hear that? Did, did they, um, 
did they say something about the radiation? <laughs> and all of a sudden, they come over to a control, which is where I'm at. Maneuver and control. We have a high radiation leak in the tunnel. And then everything went bat ass crazy. And, you know, everyone's jumping up, get, grabbing your EABs. And EAB is called an emergency air breathing mask. And that's basically a, a totally self-contained breathing system that you have to plug your mask into. The little manifolds all throughout the boat. And you can't breathe if you're not plugged into a manifold. And, you know, you got to strap the mask on, plug your mask in, and you can breathe. And if you have to go somewhere, you have to hold your breath, unplug, go to the next manifold, plug in, and then, and then you can breathe. Okay, so that's how the EAB is working. And normally, you don't want to wear them. And drills, you're trying not to because they really, really sucks having to hold your breath and walk. You know, every every 15 feet, there's a manifold, but they could be full of other people plugged in. You have to go the next 15 feet across they're through crap, through hatches, while you're holding your breath to plug into the manifold. So in drills, we you know, no one's looking. You pop your mask and breathe a bit. Yeah, Not yeah. that day. We grabbed it. Give me that mask. <laughs> Plug that sucker back on. We had to do an emergency surface. We had to surface and we had to ventilate the boat and they had to go into the reactor compartment to fix a leak. Wow. Uh, so so you guys we were stuck nervous. in rubber. Yeah, we, they call it sucking rubber when you're wearing your EABs. We were stuck in rubber for about eight hours. Oh, wow. That day. Um, while they ventilated the boat and, and the guy who was in the tunnel, poor dude had to have a scrub party, which basically if you get irradiated, like if like there's four basic types of radiation, alpha, beta, gamma, neutron, right? Um, alpha is just uh, helium atom stripped of electrons. Beta is just a charged particle, like an electron. Uh, neutron is a neutron. And gamma is light. Yeah. Okay. And if you get like alpha or neutron, uh, alpha radiation, it's it doesn't hurt your it, 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 on your skin, but if you breathe it, it'll kill you. Yeah. Right. So it, 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 you can't die from it, you know, absorbing it through your skin, but internally, it'll, it's not good. That's why you wear the mask. So this guy got irradiated. So we had to destroy all of his clothes and had to wire brush every inch of his body. Wow. With a wire brush to make sure he doesn't have any alpha particles on him. Are you saying wire brush? Is that like, that's not really skin like, friendly. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. Which is yeah. why I said, poor guy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to say. <laughs> there's all kinds of, yeah, there's, there's all kinds of hazards on a submarine. There's one hazard that I never had happened to me. Thank God. Cause I had a brain. Oh. Um, but some people, uh, weren't so fortunate. Let, let me tell you, you know, toilets, they don't have toilets like you have in your house on the submarine. Yeah. I would assume that yeah. toilets don't work the same way. Yeah. I would assume what that. happened. Wait, the, basically you have the bowl and on the bottom of the bowl, you have a ball valve. You know what a ball valve is? You can flip it. it it's just a round valve that, yeah. that has a hole through one, one axis of it. And then you either turn it one way or 90 degrees it's either open or shut right yeah yeah so so there's a ball valve on the bottom of the toilet and normally it's open you ha and there's a big flapper handle along the side of the toilet it's about like two feet long flapper handle that you rotate the ball valve with if you can picture that like yeah. a, a handle on a ball valve next to the toilet and so when you do your business yeah when you're done you stand facing the toilet and on the bulkhead behind the toilet up above, there's a valve that you, you turn on the flushing water and the water flushes around the rim of the toilet. And then you open up this ball valve yeah. and it all goes down into the toilet, into this big tank. And then when, you, when it's all clean, you shut the ball valve, let the water fill up a little bit, then you turn the water off. So it's a two-handed operation, right? Yeah. Uh, to, 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 uh, but you're, while you're standing over the toilet bowl, you're doing this okay now the hole is about a good three inch diameter hole th uh, that the ball valve is yeah okay yeah so a, a three inch diameter hole in this ball valve normally it's shut and when you want to flush the toilet you open it up it all goes to the, the to this tank and you shut the ball valve well you're on patrol for three months and you know even though it's a it's a big tank there's 150 guys it gets full yeah 
and they have to blow it out to sea. Well, they're not going to surface the boat to blow it out to sea because we're supposed to remain undetected. And so in order to blow it out to sea, you have to pressurize the tank to 50 pounds over whatever sea pressure you happen to be at, which, as we've discussed before, could be a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I'm right? with you. I'm with you. So on the other side of that ball valve <laughs> is a tank full of you know what? Yeah. Under an incredible amount of pressure. So I'm, I'm just going to say this. I'm going to assume it like backfired. <laughs> well, let, sometimes it takes about four or five hours to do this evolution. It's not just a blow and go. Yeah. It takes a while to yeah. do this evolution. So you can't use the toilet. Don't flush the toilets. They put these little signs on the stall. says, caution, blowing sanitaries. Okay. In other words, don't flush the toilet but sometimes you got to go you can't hold it five hours you got to go you can go just don't flush and every time i saw that sign i would shove one hand in my back pocket my left hand would go into my back pocket and that would never leave my pocket until i was done out of that stall yeah that's a good precaution yeah yeah my my left hand was in my rear pocket even i'm sitting on the toilet it's hanging down there in my rear pocket until I left that stall, that hand never left that pocket. Some yes. people didn't take that precaution or were half asleep or were just stupid. Yeah. So picture this. You're standing over the toilet and you open up the flushing water and you rotate that ball valve to a nice three-inch hole. And on the other side of that ball valve is a lot of pressure. And you know what? And remember, whatever you put there is going to be the first to come back. Yeah, I under, yeah, I'm, I'm foreseeing what's going to happen. Take a fire hose yeah. and <laughs> shut, put it under your chin oh, and Lord. turn it on. Yeah. That's what it is. You can hear it through the entire boat. Whoa! You, you can hear it through the entire boat. Everybody knows exactly what happens when they hear that. And I was in the, I was in the cruise lounge one day. On my rounds, I'd stop to talk to some guy, and the cruise lounge is right next to the head. And this guy that I was talking to before had had just blown the tanks to the patrol before, the previous patrol that we were on. He had he had done it to himself. So I'm sitting there talking to this guy, and all of a sudden we hear, Whoa! we were both like startled, jump up, and he goes, Hey, I know that noise. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you should. <laughs> and what happens is of course, that guy, you know, he's got to clean it up, okay? Oh. And while he's, and it goes everywhere, okay? It's like a fire hose under your chin. Your beard gets separated, toilet paper wrapped around your glasses. I mean, it's really bad, and it's just not, not nice. <laughs> and while he's doing that, somebody goes and turns off all the water heaters for the showers. So by the time he goes to take a shower, it's going to be nice and cold. Oh. And the captain comes on the one MC, which is the announce shipboard announcing circuit. The one MC, hey, oh, Petty Officer Smith just got the golden flapper for this patrol, <laughs> and everybody knows he did it. And, oh, it's just, it's, uh, yeah. So there's some hazards you you got to watch out for. On yeah, I understand that. First of all, you're underwater, so that's a hazard by itself. <laughs> but the stories, yes. the stories are amazing, Rudy. I'm I'm enjoying this a lot. So. Uh, we're gonna start continue a bit. You did four years. Uh, yes. What did you do after your service? You did your four years. Uh, you saying goodbye to the Navy. What happened? I went to Sarasota, Florida again, where I was living, um, and I started cooking again because that's what I had done before. Which um, I, I didn't like. I, I I had a bad attitude. I had a bad taste when I got out of the Navy. Because they kind of mistreated me on some things. They mistreated my, my – I stepped on a stingray when I was in the Navy. I had to have two surgeries in the Navy, and they still didn't fix me. I had to go to the civilian doctor to get it fixed because the oh. stingray left splinters when it went through my foot and ran along the toe bone. Um, oh, my God. I had to – yeah, it was not, that was not a fun day. And the Navy totally mistreated me, totally just screwed me over. There's always so I really did – 
there's always that's why when people in this country were talking about uh, government health care, I'm like, no, no, you don't. <laughs> Yeah. No, no, I was under that. No, <laughs> don't do that. Not yeah. good. Uh, yeah, because I'm like, no, they, they, they mistreat. They, I went in with a hole all the way through my foot. Okay, yeah. bleeding like a stuck pig. They made me wait seven hours in the ER before they even looked at me. Um, not joking. Seven hours I waited until they finally looked at me, and then they knew it. There were splinters in my foot. They knew the hole was all the way through. They said, "Go home and come back tomorrow." What? Where I had a four-speed car that I lived 21 miles away from the base. Uh, and I had to drive my four-speed car with my left foot with a hole all the way through my left foot to go to the naval hospital to wait five hours and to say, oh, yeah, you go home and come back tomorrow. And so I come back the next day. By then, it's infected. They operate. Six, seven months later, it still hurts, still hurts. I, I twist their arm to x-ray it. They find, Oh, there's still splinters. We didn't get them all. Got to operate again. They operate again. The doctor comes in afterward. I said, did you get them? He goes, no. I said, what? He goes, yeah, we looked around. We couldn't find them. So I had a surgery for nothing. I'm sorry. When I got out of the Navy, I went to a civilian doctor, and he said, they left you like this? I'm like, yeah, well, they're the splinters. Like, yeah, there they are. I'm not a doctor. There they are right there on the x-ray. <laughs> Right yeah, there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so yeah. So I had a bad taste. So when I got out of the Navy, I, I just wanted I do something different. So I was cooking for a while. And then my brother, Jeff, uh, was going to Missoula, Montana to go to college to get his doctorate. Oh. And I think, well, I thought, well, crap, I love mountains. I mean, one of my favorite movies watching on the sub was Mountain Men with Charlton Heston and Brian Keith. I love that movie. And I just wanted to live in the mountains. So I, I decided I was going to move out with my brother, Jeff, when he moved from Florida to, to, um, to uh, Montana. But I broke my ankle before I was going to move. So I couldn't move with him. Um, I had to wait. And then he, he moved up to Montana. So I moved up to Montana, finally. And I ended up becoming a Christian in montana and i got married uh to this girl in montana that when we 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 didn't date until we were engaged that's a whole nother story um but but we finally got married and she's the one i'm married to now we're going on our 35th year of marriage amazing, amazing. yeah um but so i got married and then i started went to college so I started going to college and I took chemistry at first because my brother was going to get his chemistry doctorate. He got a doctorate in biochemistry. And I, but I decided I didn't like chemistry when I saw PCAM, physical chemistry, coming down the pike. And I'm like, oh, time to jump ship. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I had taken a computer class. And so I thought, oh, I like computer science. So I went into computer science. So I changed my major. So I started doing computer science. I started doing pretty good. And the, the, the department chair really liked me because he was a vet. He was an army vet from Vietnam. He used to fly helicopters in Vietnam. And a wonderful guy named Jerry Esme. Um, I think he's since passed on, sad to say, but I love that guy. He was awesome. He got me an internship in Helena, Montana, which is the state capital, a little, you know, like a two-hour drive away, um, for a year working as a programmer. Uh, using COBOL, if you're familiar with any programming languages. This is an old language. It's, it's English type, like language. Um, but it's used for mainframes, for big, big systems, like insurance companies and state governments and stuff like that. So I got an internship using COBOL. Well, when I was married going to school in Missoula, we had four kids by the time I got that internship. And when I was living in Helena, my fifth child, Sarah, my youngest, uh, came around. And when the internship ended, I was supposed to go back and, and finish my degree. But at the, that time, I had five kids. And I'm thinking, crap, do I have to move my family back just to go back to school and live in student housing with five kids instead? And, and, I, and my brother, after, after he had gotten his degree, he got a doctorate. He was down in Aurora, Colorado. And he said, there's tons of tech jobs down here. And this was during the 90s, like 95 by this time. And 
the, and with IT, the good thing about IT in this country is they really don't care if you have a degree or not. They really care if you can do the job. So yeah. about 98% of the job postings will say degree and or education and experience. In other words, we'll take the degree, but if you don't have the degree, if you've got the education experience, we'll take you. And it's about 90% of the jobs were like that in IT, and I needed a job. I had five little mouths saying, feed me, feed me. And I, <laughs> I, I, I couldn't. I didn't want to go back to Missoula and, and take another year or two of college. I needed to, to, supply, to support my family. And my brother convinced me to try to apply. So I came, went down to Aurora. And I applied all around. I ended up getting a job in Colorado Springs, which is about an hour south of Denver, um, for a company called MCI Telecommunications. I don't know if you're ever familiar with the old MCI phone company that was in America. They they basically broke up a monopoly that AT&T had at the time over telecommunications and allowed a new company. To, you know, and that's why we have cheap phone calls in this country now. Thank you, MCI. Yeah. Um, but I got a job as a programmer for MCI, so I moved down to Colorado Springs. And I worked there for a while. And I, I ended up trying to move up the ladder. As I would get a job, I would try to learn more and get a better job. Okay? And, yeah. and, and with IT, you can, you can kind of do that. Like I said, because most jobs, they just care, can you do the job? They don't really care about the piece of paper unlike education in this country where you can't do anything without a degree. Yeah. Basically. So I ended up becoming a substitute teacher. Long story out that's down the road. But so anyway, so I got this job at MCI. I'm working in, in MCI and uh, I, I moved to uh, Rochester, Minnesota for a short job for the Mayo Clinic. I don't know if you've ever heard of yeah. them. Yeah, it's like a world famous Mayo Clinic. Yeah. Actually, my last open abdominal surgery was at the Mayo Clinic. My last of three open abdominal surgeries I had was at the Mayo. Anyway, so I, I, I got this job at the Mayo Clinic, and then I went back to Colorado Springs. Then I got a job in Helena, Montana with MCI, um, putting in the state's uh, hunting and fishing licensing system for their Fish, Wildlife, and Parks Department. That's cool. So I got to get my job, and I got to move back to Helena because I love Montana. Montana is my favorite state so far that I've lived in. Even though I think in my mind, Colorado Springs, where I live now, is my favorite city, but Montana is my favorite state. And I, and I got a chance to take my job back to Montana, and that's when MCI went down the tubes. Yeah. They went bankrupt, lost my job, moved back to Mon uh, Colorado Springs. So There's a lot more jobs back there, and I had contacts back there. So I ended up getting another job, and then I got sick. I, I had uh, I got gastric bypass in, in 03 and one year I one day from the one year anniversary of my surgery of getting gastric bypass I had to have my gallbladder out oh and that started the downward spiral and things started happening I started having pain and pain and more pain and they ended up doing an exploratory surgery to see what's going on they opened me up uh, 17 inches in my abdomen to see what's going on and they and they couldn't figure it out and then they started putting me on pain meds and more pain meds and I ended up losing jobs because I kept getting sick and sick and sick finally I got put on disability I got put on a on permanent disability and but by then they had been feeding me so much narcotics I don't know if you know what the lot it is no. You know what the lot it is? No. It's it's 80 times as strong as as morphine. Is that oh, And uh, yeah. everyone knows what and and everyone knows what fentanyl is, right? Yeah. That's 100 times as strong as morphine. I was on both of them. Oh my god. Like a somber. And when you get the when you get to fentanyl, they would have <laughs> transdermal patches. And most people would have a 25 microgram transdermal patch. In other words, that that's feeding 25 micrograms an hour through your skin. Wow. I was on 100 microgram patches. But you recovered. I was awake maybe, I was maybe two hours awake, couldn't string three sentences together. I was basically, like you said, a zombie. Yeah. My wife was, was, was freaking out. And at the same time, my, I started having more and more pain and pain in my gut and pain. 
finally one day I was in so much pain. My wife took me to the hospital and they knocked me out. They just, I don't remember the rest of this. They knocked me out and they said my spleen was way too big for my body. And they had to, they said, if we leave it in, he'll be dead in a week in excruciating pain. If we try to take it out, he'll most likely bleed to death on the table. Uh -oh. And they asked my wife, what do you want to do? And right and by then we had five kids in school. Yeah. And she was like, you know, she broke down on the highway coming home, trying to keep it up for the kids, you know, say dad's sick, but she didn't want to let on, even though they all told me later on, they all knew. But, um, I mean, she ended up saying, just take it out. Thank God, obviously, because I'm here. My spleen was the size of a small watermelon. Wow. The doctor said, baby. He held his hands apart about a foot and a half. He said, baby. That's how big my spleen was, and it's normally the size of your fist. You're one lucky guy. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> I almost guess. died with that. I almost died twice on that. They almost coded me in the ICU. I was in ICU for four days, no, five days. I was in ICU for five days after that surgery, and uh, they almost coded me. They kept telling me to breathe and breathe, and I'm like, I thought they were mad at me. You know that, that you're supposed to breathe this little float, this little ball, you know, yeah. little BB and whatever. Yeah. They said, breathe. And I thought they were mad at me. I'm like, screw you. You breathe heavy, man. I got just dead like a fish, man. <laughs> you know, like, screw yeah. you. Yeah. I, but I wasn't breathing. They were freaking out. They were about ready to intubate me. And they kicked my wife out of the ICU because they thought I was circling the drain. Wow. Rudy, you're so, amazing. Amazing. Uh, we're going on for an hour now. So, of course, we have... Gotten through a oh, point. Oh, I'll have to stop. Yeah. yeah. No, don't worry about it. Uh, I, I, I told you I wouldn't have a trouble filling it. No, no. And I had no trouble listening to it. I want to thank you, Rudy, for being a part of Share Your Story um, Military Podcast. Uh, I hope you did enjoy this, Rudy. Did you? I loved it. I loved it. Yeah. <laughs> I did, too. For your listeners, thank you so much for listening. And yet again, to... Uh, to Rudy and his story. We're going to wrap up. And uh, thank you so much, Rudy. And uh, next episode is on November. Until next time, I'm Ricky. This is Rudy. You guys, stay safe.